Well, hey there, everyone. Declutter your life. There are so many videos and self-help books and etc. out there about clearing out your stuff. It can accumulate and get to be too much. That is for granted. There's a perception that stuff holds you down and keeps you from living free. We look at people who live minimalistic lifestyles, you know, monks and such like, and we hold them in high esteem because they have broken free from the cycle, they have risen above materialism and capitalism and so on and so forth. And good for them. If that truly works for them or for you, that is terrific. I'm not here to argue about anyone's lifestyle. Your level of stuff is up to you whatever works for you. What I want to discuss is the stuff. What's it all about? Why do we accumulate it? A video or two ago I touched on this. It's the Marie Kondo thing, right? Does it spark joy? But it's not just joy. There are other factors that go into it to your decision to keep a thing and then whether to keep it out or whether to stuff it in a box, whether to have it out or away. First we have sentimentality. What does the thing mean to you? Is it a book? Or is it the book that saw you through a bout of chicken pox? Okay, 80s kid talking here. We have the chicken pox. Let me pull out something I got here. Okay. First, I keep everything. My kids have given me for presents. Check these out. Bob Ross chopsticks. <laughs> I keep everything my kids have given me for presents. I'm pretty sure my mom did this too. And that's because it's it's the cliche. It's not just the present. It's the meaning behind it. It's the fact that they gave it to me that they put thought into what would their mommy like. It, it doesn't matter whether I feel they got it right or not. It's the thought behind it. And I, it's the same thing with my stuff from my husband. The difference is that I usually make a list and I expect him to look at it. And after so many years, I really expect he will know what I like. And it's, it's a whole nother kettle of fish, but uh, still overall the same thing. Then there are the things centered around a particular favorite memory. And photos are a good example of this. Lots of people have theirs just digitally nowadays and that that's fine you know as long as you have them i have them digitally too but one thing i'm a big believer in is hard copies of everything besides which there's just there's no substitute for spending an afternoon or an evening by yourself or particularly as a family going through the old family photos, laughing at the memories, um, filling the kids in on new ones, handing them around, spreading them out. I just feel it's the physical action associated with the activity that makes it special. I'm a big believer in something tactile. It's just it's much nicer than everyone gathered around a screen. It, it can make the experience itself a treasured memory. Besides photos, and I do have an example, look at that face, look at that face. It's the only one I could, there we go, there we go. It's the only one I could find because I don't really keep photos of myself and I don't share photos of my family. So, except the dog, look at that face. Besides photos, there are also souvenirs from travels or, or anything that was given to you by a special someone, a special time, a special place, a combination of all three. It's, it's the story behind the object. Always. How about the things you collect or just accumulate? Collections tend to start because you have a particular affinity for that particular type of thing. There may be a definite reason behind this, a story, or maybe you just like that type of thing and you're not sure why. I used to have a collection of brochures for theme parks and tourist traps. I had a whole shoebox full of them. I didn't have any particular reason for this. I hadn't been to most of them and I didn't plan to, but like on a rainy day, I like to sit and look through them. I think it was kind of a way to explore or see the world beyond my dinky little town back in the my teen years when the internet was in its infancy. I'm old. I also had a collection of broken golf tees in a jam jar. I liked the way they looked, and also it wasn't like a treasured memory, but 
I caddied one time for my grandfather, and I picked them up on the way. So I guess it was just a way to remember a nice, simple, special time that I spent with my grandfather. Again, there was nothing particularly special about that day or memory, and maybe that explains why I later cleaned it out. But I, I still have the memory, and it was a thing I enjoyed having at the time. Nowadays, I don't collect very much. I do collect ooh, Takumi Saito DVDs uh, because I like the actor and I don't entirely trust tr streaming services. And uh, they're foreign films, they're Japanese films, so uh, they can be a little tougher to get in this country. So nothing sentimental there. The reason why it doesn't always have to be complex. It can just be something that sparks joy. Hobbies can cause you to accumulate some things as well. Ever since I started knitting uh, over 20 years ago, I have accumulated needles, yarn, knitting magazines, and even after 20 years, I'm still hardly an expert at it. I, I just knit for fun. I keep busy. I make stuff for friends and family. And why do I need that many knitting needles? No matter what, I only have two hands. <laughs> but some things like, here, this super cool, look at this, this super cool needle holder. I can't, I can't resist holding onto it because it belonged to my grandmother-in-law. I don't think it had any particular sentimental value for her, but it's just, it belonged to her. It, that makes it cool. And then things like the magazines, it's mostly because they're old, and I like old things. And no matter what, old or new, they're new to me. And if I haven't used them already, I might someday. This leads me to a very big reason why we hold on to stuff. Wishful thinking. I've never had a use for this, but I might someday. I've never learned how to do this thing that I have equipment for, but someday I will. I don't have time for this thing right now, but I may eventually. These things are akin to New Year's resolutions. You have the best of intentions, but you are probably never going to get around to them. And the problem with that line of thinking is that, albeit rarely, very rarely, sometimes these things do happen, and when they do happen, when you do get around to them, you want to be ready. After all, if you do cave in and get rid of that thing that you are positive you do not need, and I've confronted this so many times, if you cave in and you get rid of that thing, I guarantee you that sometimes, Within the next few days, anywhere within the next few days to the next six months, you will be running around going, where's that thing? Where's that thing? I totally need that thing. And you don't have it anymore because you got rid of it. Now, here's a big thing. Your stuff is, at least outwardly, you. It is a physical representation of your personality. It's the person you are. It's the life you have lived and are continuing to live. Like when you go into someone's house, you look around, you observe, you point out a thing or two and mention it if only just to be polite. Objects have a purpose that way. They can facilitate social interactions by giving you clues to go off of. Even when we're virtually interacting, we're doing that. Think about a Zoom meeting and the person you're talking to. You're looking for those clues. You're making those judgment calls. Are they wearing jewelry? Are they wearing a hat? Do they have a pet? What is behind them? What are the titles of the books on their shelves? We've all been there. We've all looked. Not to mention you know you're looking at their bookshelf more than you're looking at them. And they're probably doing the same thing to you. What you have in your home is a representation of who you are. It is the detritus of your life. People who come to your home will draw conclusions about you based on the stuff that they see. Admittedly, they may draw the wrong conclusions. Someone coming into my home might look at the Robert Jordan books on the shelf and conclude that I'm into Robert Jordan, which is not the case. They are my husband's. But there are so many other books around that uh, it might be easy for them to get more of a uh, accurate clue. One conclusion we had a lot of people jumping to in our last home was about the 
walls. They walked in, they saw the purple in the living room, they thought, oh, purple, girly color. And then, uh, even to this day, traditionally, um, in a hetero couple, it tends to be the woman who makes the interior design choices. So, going off that information, they thought that the purple was my choice. When, in fact, I really didn't have a clue about interior design and didn't care a bit. Uh, my husband had been in a couple of homes that were using purple because it was trendy at the time. And he thought it was cool looking, so I was like, okay, let's do it. But now we've moved, and we painted the walls, and check it out, it's green, it's so green, oh, I love green. In any case, these are the hazards of a multi-person home. Anywhere you live, though, you're going to make your mark upon it. Yeah? Rubber wrap. Yeah. This is the thing about stuff, or should I say the stuff about things. Minimalism is great, but it's bare. Stuff makes a place lived in. It makes it comfortable. When we live in a place, we take steps to make it our own. We paint the walls in a color that's someone's choice, at least. We bring in furniture that we hopefully like and that we didn't just get because a friend was giving it away unless we're going to college. And we get stuff. We get stuff that we put around to let ourselves and others know that we are there. Our stuff is a way of acknowledging that we exist and that we exist in this place. This is a place where we live. This is a place where we are comfortable. This is a place that we love. And this is a place where we're comfortable enough to have a little mess and we're okay with that. So it's okay to have stuff. Stuff is great. Just be aware that you can't take it with you. So it's usually best to draw a line and not have too much stuff. Plus, cleaning out is something that many of us do as we get older, and that's fine, too, because none of us wants to leave a bunch of crap for our relatives to have to deal with. It may mean a great deal to us, but that doesn't mean it's going to mean a great deal to other people. And that's just fine. Keeping that in mind, when you inevitably get in the position of having to clean out someone else's stuff after they're gone, be kind. Because it may seem like crap to you, but to them it may have meant a very great deal. What will people say about your things after you're gone? And like I say, it's the detritus of a life, but more than that, it kind of is a life. Because after we're gone, what's left? Memories and stuff. And neither of those last. Sour stuff is a very big part of us. It's a very big part of who we are. And that's what makes it important. So... What's something that is of particular importance to you? What's something that you don't have that you really want, and why is that? What's something that you have that was passed to you by a relative that you really care about? Maybe there's a shared memory, maybe not, but, but why is that? These are the personal stories. These are the things that make us us. It's fascinating. I hope you have a wonderful week, and that you're able to appreciate what you have. It's amazing when you look around at the things you have and you really consider them. It, it makes you appreciate what you have all the more. See you next time. Hi there. Not you, boy. Hello, dog. Oh, it's a dog. Oh, yeah, it's a camera for you. Let me try this again.